Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, once again in our Sunday uh, lecture series. Tonight, I have the privilege uh, to introduce a, a very special person who in turn will introduce another a very uh, special uh, person. Belanka Smigel Ruther and her family are members of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue and dear friends of our shul for so many years. And they are truly a wonderful uh, people. I've gotten to know the family quite well over these past uh, few years. Uh, Lucia, Belanka, and Mitch, and family, as well as uh, Robert and Michelle and family. And I would have to say that I have three observations uh, how to de define the, the family. Uh, the first is they are probably one of the most uh, highly talented families I've uh, ever met. Um, each one is more talented uh, than the next. You know, Belanka works with her mother on the uh, tooth care business. That's her primary job, but on the side, she happens to um, be involved in producing Broadway plays, maybe something called Hamilton, if you ever heard of it. I think she may have been involved in, uh, in that, am I correct? <laughs> um, a little bit, and, um, and uh, Blanca will introduce her brother tonight, Robert, who um, is a producer and a writer, no stranger to the Fifth Avenue Synagogue, as uh, during the high holidays, Robert is uh, always there when the uh, Smigel brother row. Uh, we look forward to seeing all, everyone there each and every year. Um, the second thing that thought that comes to mind is the great values that the family has, uh, strong, strong Jewish values. And uh, Mitch and Blanca are always looking to do the right thing, calling up, is this okay to do? Is that okay to do? Trying to do to get it right. And in general, the family is most definitely a warm, friendly, and extremely considerate uh, family. And the third uh, most uh, striking observation about the family is uh, the family unity and loyalty that they have for one another. Uh, the late father, Dr. Erwin Smigel, a very influential man who is known as the father of aesthetic uh, dentistry. And when he passed away, you know, it was clear how important it was to the family to honor his memory, uh, to uh, remember him through the Kaddish and through different sponsorships. The sukkah every year is kindly sponsored by the family. And it's very, truly remarkable to see such loyalty and dedication to the father and with one another, um, uh, this close-knit family is truly something to look up to. And we only want to bless the family with the health and happiness, many reasons to celebrate for many, many years to come and to, join, to enjoy one another as a company uh, uh, in good health. Um, Blanca will now introduce her brother, Robert. And I think, Blanca, you did promise that you will only say nice things, correct? Um, so, <laughs> almost, almost. So uh, we're very excited to have Robert tonight. He's a busy man, and uh, Blanca is also busy. So please uh, give your attention to Blanca, who will introduce uh, Robert Smigel. Right. Well, thank you so much, ba Rabbi Babbage, for saying all those things. And we're very fortunate to have my mom here with us, and we are very close-knit, and thank God for that. So thank you. I miss seeing you in person and everyone else. And um, but anyway, thank you. And I wanted to start by telling everyone I am Robert Smigel's sister. That is a line that I have said on numerous occasions. I say it to the bouncers at Saturday Night Live parties. I say it to people who are working the film sets where Robert is either producing, directing, acting, or, or writing a movie. I say it to get on the red carpet when Robert is there. And I say it to celebrities who I know have worked with Robert. And Every time I say it, I get an incredibly positive response. One reason is because Robert is a comedic genius. And not only do my, his family and his fans know that, but his peers also really admire him. And also because he's an incredibly kind person and incredibly great to work with. So um, that's why I say it all the time. And I do have to tell you all that Robert does have some faults and his two major faults are he is incredibly humble, way too humble and way too self-deprecating, but everyone's going to see that very soon. So I don't have to harp on that anymore. Robert started his career in Chicago. He went there on his way to dental school and uh, it was when Al Franken came to Chicago discovered him, Senator Al Franken came and discovered Robert and brought him to Saturday Night Live. At Saturday Night Live, he wrote the funniest and the most famous sketches of that era. And then he later 
did all these amazing cartoons that are still being played now and that are called favorites. Also at his time at Saturday Night Live, he had his crazy fanatical sister on the set all the time. So much so that people at Saturday Night Live thought that I worked there. Once when Bruce Springsteen was rehearsing, was the musical guest, I was there at every rehearsal. And at one rehearsal, Tom Hanks, who was the host that night, came over to me when I was with a friend and said, could you please introduce me to Bruce Springsteen? I haven't met him yet. That's Robert. That's because Robert was so generous in having me there all the time. And he is, that's how he is now with my, he's been like that with my children. They've been in his movies. He's been like that with, of course, his children have been in many of his movies. He has three beautiful sons and they've been in his films and he works tirelessly with his wife on a special called Night of Too Many Stars, which raises millions of dollars for autism. That's an Emmy winning show. And when we're speaking of Emmys, uh, Robert's first Emmy, he's have mul he has multiple Emmys. His first Emmy is sitting <laughs> in my parents' home because that's Robert. <laughs> he's the first Emmy, there it is in my parents' den. He gave it to them. And um, that's, he, he's still, after all this time and how busy and stressful, believe me, being a comedian and a comedy writer is very stressful. He, it is. And after all these years, just recently, when he was working with my favorite football player of all time, I open my phone and I get a text and there's Brett Favre in a video saying, hey, Belanca, I wish you were here. I'm getting a great time working with your brother, but be great to see you. That's Robert. So I am proud and I am happy and I want to tell you, I hope now you understand that why I say with pride, with love and joy that I am Robert Smigel's sister. And here he is. Here I am after that. What thank, are you going to do? Thank, I thank. am such a good person. I can't believe it. <laughs> That's self-deprecating, Robert. That thing is more endearing than false modesty. <laughs> filled with it. So thank, thank you, Blanca, for that uh, kind introduction. And hopefully Robert will have a chance to introduce you when we do a Zoom with you and when we pick a date in January, February. Ah, so Robert, Robert, you'll get your, your, uh, your My chance. Revenge. My revenge. My revenge. Yes. Oh, God, I can't wait. So, so Robert. Uh, no, I just, let me say, uh, she's right about, I, I have put her very talented boys in, in TV shows and movies. Uh, Russell was a newborn, practically, right, Blanca? Blanca, come back. <laughs> yes, right. Russell was a newborn. Russell was, uh, yeah. my nephew Russell was about how many months old when we put him on a Saturday Night Live sketch? Nine or something like that, probably nine to 11. Nine to 11 months. He played the baby in a um, Look Who's Talking parody. And then Eric, I'm very proud of this. I put Eric in a sketch when I was the head writer of the Conan O'Brien show. I think he was about three. Yep. And yes. we had him uh, appearing to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> yeah. In the sketch. And so. That's very funny. And that's Aaron, a, that's, a, that's a good movie. uncle, huh? And Aaron was in the movie where Cantor Malavani was singing. Yes, oh, yeah. Adam Sandler, the Kill Mullet. Cantor yes. Malavani, uh, you know. Uh, right. That was an honor for Sandler to have Cantor Malavani in his movie, as, as, as far as I'm concerned. Cantor Malavani, we love the shul, but above everything, uh, you know, Cantor Malavani's, uh, Cantor Malavani's talent and humanity and dedication is what has made us, you know, devoted members of the shul more than anything else. He's incredible. Rabbi Roth. And Cantor Malavani presided over my wedding and Blanca's weddings. And um, Cantor Malavani, uh, you know, and we love Rabbi Roth and he's a brilliant writer and a brilliant mind and a wonderful, wonderful man as well. Cantor Malavani, uh, one of the things I love about Cantor Malavani is he does not, uh, and I say this with great affection, he's not cursed with, um, uh, 
you know, he, he's not phony about he 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 he's not uh, self-deprecating. He doesn't <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't pretend that he's not as as great as he is. He 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 doesn't waste your time saying, oh no 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 no. He's like he gets it. He's brilliant. And um, there's I'll tell you one funny story. When Belanca got married to Mitch, and I was uh, I was standing you know right next to. Uh, Tanner Malavani, uh, as he was singing uh, his his wedding uh, blessing, and it was just stunning. It was I'd never gotten to stand that close to him before, and and hear him sing so beautifully. And so, just <laughs> right as the song ended, I just had to whisper to him. That was just amazing. And then he just looked at me <laughs> and very quietly said, "Wait till you hear the next one." <laughs> So now, now we know to move your back row to the earlier row so you can hear him better on Rosh Hashanah Kippur. I'm sorry? So now we know to move your row from the back to the front. No, 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 no. Be a little we closer. Like in the back. We like being in the back. If anybody, that's probably what I'm most famous for at Fifth Avenue Synagogue is uh, during the Amida, I'm the guy in the back who takes twice as long as everybody else in the shul. That's a good <laughs> so, so, so Robert, that's really appreciate That's I took from my father. Well, your dad used to sit more up front. No, my dad. My dad took his time with the uh, with the Shimon Astray. That's the way he yeah. played, and um, and I respected that. I wasn't capable of going any faster than I could go, but I it, it allowed me to feel like it was okay to to do it at the pace that I I was capable of doing it at. That's great. So, 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 Robert, can uh, pre we all appreciate your time tonight? Can you tell just to start the conversation? At what when did you first come to Fifth Avenue Synagogue? At what age? I guess I was in my late teens. Okay. I think, uh, we had moved to the uh, neighborhood in the mid '70s. We lived on the Upper West Side. Um, we grew up on the Upper West Side, and um, when I was very young, we we went to uh, a Stiebel on West 84th Street. Besser, your dad told me yes. was Besser. Rabbi Besser was, that's right, the famous Rabbi Besser, the rabbi of 84th Street. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there's a great book about him. And, um, but my grandfather, Sebastian Smigel, had co-founded that shul many years earlier. And, um, so that was kind of all we knew. And then, then I got bar mitzvahed at a slightly larger shul on 77th uh, West Side Institutional. And then we moved. Um, and uh, it was right before Rabbi Roth took over, I believe. And so, so in tribute to your dad, who I was a huge fan of, and I had mm -hmm. the privilege of working in the same building. Maybe before we go into yourself, let's talk a little bit about your dad. I know your mom's on the call tonight, but uh, it's, it's all so embarrassing to me. Oh, okay. We, 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 can, we, can, we can. I asked her not okay. to watch. I'm sorry. I asked her not to because I'm just I'm I'm just so bad at talking about myself. I just okay, okay. But, okay. Uh, you know, I'm gonna do it. I'm doing you it for great you. Job. Okay, doing I appreciate. Anything. I appreciate it, Robert. So 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 Blanca was speaking a little bit. So it sounds yeah. like you were gonna go to dental school. You, you were going to Chicago and you were on your yeah. way to dental school. Is that correct? Yes, I went to dental school because my dad um, was a brilliant dentist. He was an innovator. He was one of the very first dentists to develop. He, he, he figured out how to take this material that was made from an acrylic uh, that was designed to make fillings white instead of silver and he figured out how to use it on chip teeth and eventually how to use it in a way to reshape other teeth and, and basically reshape people's smiles. And uh, he coined the term tooth bonding, which is what it's known as nowadays. And, uh, and obviously he became a leader in the field and uh, you know, was a pioneer as well in the field of you know, porcelain laminates, which is what people use now. And, uh, so, and he also became uh, well-known on television talking about these 
these innovations. And he really changed the face of dentistry. Like when I was a kid, you know, I was always interested in comedy. And um, when I was a little kid, my dad was the dentist. And in my mind, I thought of dentistry as like, you know, I thought of it as the butt of many jokes. It was dental jokes were like mother-in-law jokes, you know, like the, they're all about, uh, uh, you know, they're all about the, the pain and suffering of having to go to the dentist. You know, dentist equaled agony in everybody's mind. And it became, you know, a staple of, uh, of dentist jokes. And my father really changed that probably more than anyone in his field because he, he basically, um, you know, was, was the pioneer of cosmetic dentistry. And that's, people think of dentists as much nowadays, you know, um, with that in mind as they do with any, any kind of, you know, pain related dentistry. And so he was, uh, you know, he really revolutionized it and he, you know, his accomplishments are, are immeasurable, uh, you know, in that field. And he, uh, yeah, so so people have never really looked at dentistry the same way since since he uh, came on the you know <laughs> since he started cosmetic dentistry. Um, uh, that's all I got, Jake. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot. Your dad, I used to love oh, always. What? Sorry, your dad was just always a super mensch and. Uh, Oh yeah, no. He was a terrific, he was a wonderful person. man, and, and, uh, and your parents are a great team. So, yeah. uh, well, yes, they created. Uh, you know, my dad was very, very generous that way too. He he didn't want my mother was uh, you know brilliant herself and had uh, you know a lot of ambition when she was young, and then she got married at a very young age, and my father didn't want to you know, relegate her to being a housewife. So they worked together in yeah, the office. Always together. Yeah, they were, she worked, as, she managed his office going back to the 60s. And then eventually she was really the, the person who had the, uh, the real impetus to create the toothpaste that still exists today that they, they sell everywhere, uh, Super Smile. You know, um, she was the one who, who really came up with the idea of, um, uh, using peroxide, form of peroxide that became calcium peroxide. And, uh, you know, it started, I believe, with baking soda. Uh, you know, she was really, uh, she worked with a chemist back then. And, um, you know, she's also, you know, a brilliant sculptor as well, sculptress. I don't want to be sexist, but uh, she'd probably prefer the term sculptress. Okay. She's old school. But, um, so, 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 so you said you were into comedy at a young age, dental jokes. Yeah. So for me, I, I was very funny in my mind at a young age, I could draw cartoons really well from age five. And that's how I, you know, functioned at, at school. I, I, I was the kid who, you know, drew cartoons of all my classmates, did impressions of the teachers, that kind of thing. And I loved comedy, but I never, ever imagined that I could have a career in it. It just seemed like incredibly remote and uh, unreachable. And so meanwhile, my dad's career was, as I was a teenager, my dad's career was, was skyrocketing. And I had no other goals in my life other than to be funny, really. So I just figured, well, that's not going to be something I can do for a living. So I might as well be a dentist. <laughs> and uh, so I went to Cornell and uh, was a pre-dental student there. And pre-dental is uh, almost as hard as pre-med. And that was, I was a good student, but I wasn't, science was the one course that I always had to work hard at when I was in high school. And when it got to the pre, you had to take these the same course as pre-medical students took you know, general chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, biology. And this was just, I just couldn't handle it. I really, you know, 
if I had been better at science, I probably would have ended up being a dentist, but I was so bad. Thank God. <laughs> but I don't touch him. Yeah. No, so. So, 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 so you're in Chicago now? Where are you in school? You're, you're in. Oh, so no, I was in, I, 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 so I went to Cornell. I had okay. two years of humiliation there of trying, uh, you know, pushing a rock up a hill. Uh, and, um, and then I just asked my parents, I was so broken that I asked my parents, I was the funny kid in, the only thing I was good at in college was making the kids in my dorm laugh. So finally I was like, can I take a year at NYU and just study acting and communications and, you know, those kind of courses. And they, uh, they were cool with it. So I moved to New York. I went back to New York. They they were just cool with it. You just said, I want to do it for a year. You know, my dad was an incredibly loving dad. He never put pressure on me to become a dentist ever. That's great. Um, And so he, um, when I, you know, he knew I was trying and he knew that, um, I was kind of broken at this time. And so he was more than willing to let me take a crack at it. So I did. And, um, you know, I had a good year. I took uh, all these courses that I enjoyed, but by the end of the year, I just felt like this isn't something I need college for. You know, I'd had enough of a taste of good classes that I enjoyed. I'd taken government classes at Cornell and, you know, psychology classes that really stimulated me with great professors. And part of me just felt like this, I can do this after college, you know, I can learn radio production, whatever it was, communications. And when I took these courses, all I I realized that I only liked really the parts where I got to, there would be weeks where you, one week you're operating a camera and the next week you're directing and the next week you're writing and the next week you're acting and the weeks I would write and act were the ones that I was excited about. So I was like, okay, I haven't learned anything. I just, all I know is that I like writing and acting, which I already knew. And so I, um, I just figured, uh, this isn't going to work out. This isn't what I'm going to college for. So let's just do some damage control. I'll stay at NYU. I'll major in political science, which I really liked. And I'll take the bare minimum pre-dental courses and try to make that work. (laughs) So I did. And with the help of a lot of tutoring and uh, sweat, I got barely passable grades just to get into NYU dental, which was my father's alma mater. And um, while I was doing it, I took, I entered a a stand-up comedy contest at NYU. And it was a contest that uh, the only reason I had the guts to enter it was because I didn't know anybody at NYU. I literally had to live with my parents and commute to NYU because back then they wouldn't let Manhattan residents live in dorms. They didn't have enough. They hadn't taken over Greenwich Village yet like they have in the past 25 years. So I was like, "Eh, no one's going to know me. So I wrote an act and did it. It was an insane act uh, that had some, uh, a lot of Jewish humor in it actually. And, uh, and I ended up being one of the winners. And then I got to perform at the Comic Strip, which was an Upper East Side club, still exists actually. And at the Ronnie Dangerfield, which one is that? No, that Dangerfield is in on 60th Street. This is on 83rd and 2nd, I believe. Okay. And um, I competed against other college students who had won their college contests. And I was one of the winners of that. And so then I won a set, like a 9.30 on a Thursday set at the Comic Strip. And that went well, so I passed. And, but, but, you know, ultimately I didn't enjoy stand-up comedy enough to be dedicated enough to pursue it. But that one night at NYU basically changed everything because it was the first night I had ever written and performed something that had made strangers laugh. And you, I, and you, enjoy, you enjoy making other people laugh. What, what's the part that inspires you the most? Is it the writing of it? I think it's, it's just coming up with, I just come up with ideas that I 
that make me laugh. On the spot? Well, I mean, on the spot, not necessarily, not on demand. Like a lot of my best ideas are by accident. Like I'll be in the shower and I'll just something will associate, free associate. And I, you know, like I came up with Triumph, the insult comic dog in the shower okay. one morning. And um, because I have a second gig for you after tonight, we have a, a comedian at our new members dinner. So I didn't know you're a stand up comedian. So. Oh, God, I'm not a stand up comedian. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Either way, so, I am so, so, a stand-up comedian. That's like one character that I created many years later. But no, I did stand-up comedy, but I just didn't. Once you pass at the comic strip, you have to start your way up at like 1.30 in the morning and perform for like the stragglers who, who have stayed. It's literally like you're performing for eight people. And, and I did really strange stuff. I was like an Andy Kaufman. Do you know who that is? Andy Kaufman aficionado. He was crazy and steve martin these were my heroes in the 70s and i used to literally start my act wearing a cotton candy beard and dressed as an orthodox um as an orthodox rabbi and i would um come out with a big prayer book and i would turn the pages like the old men in the shtibel used to turn them like <laughs> and i'd make this face and i wouldn't care about the audience and it was one of those bits where people laugh because the performer is clearly doing something strange and doesn't care. Right. And then it just went on and on. And then I would start turning the page and eating a piece of the beard, the cotton candy beard. Still like nothing's just like that. Just complete nonsense. And it was just one of those bits that like the longer you did it, the funnier it got. Uh, and then I went into like very much more generic observational stand-up humor but um that kind of stuff was harder to do at 1 30 in the morning like some nights it would work and some nights it would be like do something right and i wasn't interested in just doing uh you know traditional observational humor i, I liked like i said these were my heroes at the time were these sort of comedians who were like modern art comedians who were doing absurdist material and um, so then out of nowhere, I was at my, visiting a friend um, and I met a guy who was on Saturday Night Live at the time. His name was Tim Kazarinski. It was in 1982 um, and he had just become a cast member and I recognized him and he was shocked that anyone recognized him. And he told me about Second City in Chicago and the, these classes that he had taken. And he said, you can do it in a summer, which sounded good to me because I'm not big on committing to life choices. So, so I went there and, um, and I had a great time. And um, I performed with, I got to meet like-minded people who were, you know, and I felt like, so this is more for me, sketch comedy, because I will, I'll be more motivated because I'll be working with other people. And I'll have to, I won't be able to let them down by not working. Whereas when you are a stand up, it's much easier to sort of fall into a depression spiral and just like, I don't want to get up at one in the morning and do this kind of thing. So I ended up moving to Chicago full time and formed a comedy group there. And that's how I eventually got Saturday Night Live. But there is a funny thing that I just remembered when I said 1982. Um, that has to do with the shul, which is, so uh, you all know David Letterman, obviously. Yes. David Letterman had just started a late night show on NBC, Late Night with David Letterman. It was on at 1230 after Johnny Carson. And I was an obsessed fan of David Letterman. I had known him for years from his appearances on Johnny Carson, and then he had his own crazy morning show for a few months in the summer of 80. And uh, I couldn't have been more excited that he was the host of this show. So, cut to Rosh Hashanah, 1982. And <laughs> I'm sitting in synagogue in my suit and across all the way on the other side. Uh, sitting next to a member named Lou Soloff, who was a lovely man who was a musician. 
was um, Paul Schaefer, David Letterman's band leader and sidekick. And he's there and he's, uh, you know, he's got a yarmulke on, but he's got like big crazy sunglasses. But I knew it was Paul Schaefer. And I couldn't stop giggling, even on Yom Kippur, just because I'm looking at his face and I'm associating it with the most nonsensical sketches that he had done over the summer with Letterman. And I had to say hello to him. And over the course of a couple of Rosh Hashanahs, he became a regular there on Rosh Hashanah. And probably a year or two later, so my sister and I would talk to him. And, and he was shocked that anyone recognized him at the time. Uh, and we became kind of friendly, uh, probably mostly because Belanca was charming and uh, fun to talk to. And I was just the nerd who would ask him disturbingly specific questions about his show. But then my mother got involved because <laughs> she could see that he was being nice to me. And of course, no good deed goes unpunished. So for being nice to me and, you know, <laughs> Paul Schaefer got uh, accosted by my mom, who was like, do you want to see Robert's stuff? Robert did a, did Robert's, Robert's done some writing. He's done some performing. He's got some tapes. What do you think? And Paul Schaefer was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Of course. Okay. <laughs> like, what's he going to say in shul? On Yom Kippur, for God's sake. <laughs> so he, we literally, he took her up on it. And I ended up having an afternoon with him. I went to his house. He lived at the, his apartment at the Gramercy Hotel. And I brought this videotape of me doing a public access show. I had somehow won in a contest like a half hour of public access time on Channel C or whatever existed back then. And the Manhattan cable system. And I had written and produced a comedy show and he sat through it and he was really nice to me, but he started dozing off in the middle. <laughs> and at the end he said, hey, I are a good performer. He didn't think much of the writing, but he was very kind to even have spent time with me. And it didn't lead to anything, um, but it was just a funny kind of- uh, The way it got set up is funny. Yes, the way it got set up, uh, is something, uh, you know, and I know my mom still has the energy today. She would do the same thing for me or for my nephew, Russell, who's in comedy. <laughs> She's fearless. Yes. Uh, but then, uh, so anyway, I ended up in Chicago and that's where I actually had some success. We formed a, com I formed, I, I was in this class and I met some people and formed a comedy group with them and this group, and we did, we wrote a sketch show together and, um, one of the guys in my group got hired to be in a movie with um, Al Franken, Senator Al Franken and his partner, uh, Tom Davis was his comedy partner. They were original Saturday Night Live writers. And he got a big part in this movie that was shooting in, uh, in Chicago. And so Al and Tom came to see our show and ended up liking it very much and took us out to, for beers afterward and um, that was it. They were very complimentary and I thought, well, this is nice. It just gives me more confidence to move ahead. But then a month later, uh, just crazy coincidence, Lauren Michaels came back to Saturday Night Live. He had left in 1980. He was the original producer from 75 to 80. He left, there were five years of some turmoil and the guy I met, Tim Kazarinsky, but then Eddie Murphy came in and, and basically saved the show. But then this producer decided to leave and Lauren Michaels came back. And I read in this TV Guide article, because that was the only way you could get any news back then was from TV Guide. And uh, it said that Lauren Michaels was returning to Saturday Night Live and Al Franken and Tom Davis were gonna be the producers. And I was, uh, you know, <clears throat> in complete shock and closest I've ever come to the expression, really feeling the expression, I hit the ceiling. I couldn't believe that I was, I, I knew that it meant that I would at least get seen, you know, and considered. Like 1985, what year is this? 1985. 
Okay. So they came back and saw my show. And then three of us from the show got to audition for Lauren Michaels. And we were flown to New York and I got to meet Lauren Michaels. And he wasn't, he said, you're, you know, we have some, uh, you know, we're figuring out the cast, but you're one of those people that, you know, might be great as a writer too. And, and that's how I was hired. I was hired as a writer um, in 1985. Okay. So then, so, so walk me through. So 85, you're writing weekly for Saturday Night Live or how does that work? Yeah, I was a staff writer and, um, I was very young, and back then um, they had a they had a, a loophole in the Writers Guild uh, laws that allowed people to be paid like not half, but like sixty percent of what a regular writer gets. So I was called an apprentice writer, and okay. you know they don't allow that anymore because they think it's taking advantage of uh, people for the work they're doing. But I wouldn't have been hired otherwise. They probably would have hired a full time more veteran writer uh if they had got it so, so you're not you're not acting in 1985 you're doing this you're doing this till today at saturday Night live or or is it 85 um you, you're writing straight till 1990 or how long uh till 1993 and then i okay. then conan o'brien who i had met at saturday night live uh he joined the show at around around 1988 i think and um we became great friends and hit it off and wrote a lot of sketches together. And we, um, and then he left to do the Simpsons and then he got the opportunity to produce a late night show. David Letterman was leaving for CBS, had to be replaced. And Conan uh, was hired to be a producer for this show, which he didn't really want to do. I wanted to do it. Actually, I love the idea of taking over a yeah, late night plot and trying to do carve a new kind of innovative. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to make my mark in late night television, and um, so Conan. Uh, but I was at Saturday Night Live, and Lorne never likes to like move people off the show. You know, if I had left, he might have been interested in me coming back that way. That's what happened with Conan. So Conan was, was part of this process. He was sitting with Lauren and interviewing all these people for the talk show, like Jon Stewart and Drew Carey, uh, a lot of famous people who ended up being very successful themselves. But Conan realized, like, I don't know. I just feel like I could do it. And he just was honest with Lauren and said, I don't feel motivated enough to produce for somebody else. I, it just makes me... I want to I want to be on camera. I want to figure out a way. I'm not saying I should be the host. If you'll consider me, that'd be great. But but I can't, in all honesty, uh, take this job as a producer. I just don't feel like this is what I really want to do. And so Lauren decided to give him an audition uh, for for the host job, and and Conan did great. And then he asked me to be his to do the job that I really wanted to do. So that wow. was a thrilling opportunity. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so this is 1993. So do, do you have to leave Saturday Night Live or you can do both at the time? No, no, I left Saturday Night Live because this was a full-time job. And and the, and Lauren Michaels was cool with that. Sounds like he wasn't it wasn't really very excited about it. He tried to talk Conan into a different head writer. Okay, okay. But Conan was adamant and, uh, and we had a great time and created all these... Uh, these bits that ran on the show for many years after I left Conan's show. I only stayed there for a couple of years because it was a very intense show. And I, it coincided with me getting married and I had already been with my wife. I'd been living with my wife as a girlfriend for a number of years. And uh, Saturday Night Live had always kind of come first because I just felt so much pressure to deliver. And now I was married and I just, it just felt ridiculous to have this kind of lifestyle. So what, what year did you get married? I should, I can 93. guess from 93. 93. Okay. Yes. And, um, so how long did you stay with the car? I only stayed for a couple of years and then I moved on to, uh, sort of freelance after that. I continued at Conan for many years doing characters. I did a bit where I, you know, that was very popular at the time where 
Conan would talk to a photograph of a celebrity and the mouth would always be me doing okay. the impression of Bill Clinton or Donald Trump or Arnold Schwarzenegger, those kind of people. Um, and then, uh, and then I, uh, you know, and then I left, and then I eventually got back to Saturday Night Live. I did something for Dana Carvey. I did a show for him for. So, so you went back to Saturday Night Live full time or this is like part no, of. No, I, I, I did a show uh, for Dana Carvey, a variety show on ABC that bombed, but I did a cartoon on it called The Ambiguously Gay Duo. And this cartoon was one of the most fun things that I had, uh, you know, m one of my f most fun memories of, of being on that show. So over that summer after it was canceled, I had other ideas for cartoons. So I called Lauren Michaels and said, I have an idea, a way to come back to the show, if you're cool with it. And he was. So it was great because I could work there in sort of a limited capacity where all I had to do was produce a cartoon. I did about 13 a year, and then I cut it down to about 10 um over the years so it allowed me to do other things as well i still continued to perform on conan and i developed the triumph the insult comic dog character at the, you know in the late 90s and um you know eventually was able to write movies with adam sandler so so, so when did so, so, so when did when did the movies start with adam sandler what year did you start that well i i think the first movie i wrote with him was in the year uh 2000 or so and it was this movie uh, called You Don't Mess With the Zohan, which was a yeah, movie about an Israeli Mossad agent who longs to be a hairdresser. And it was um, something we wrote together with Judd Apatow in the year 2000, and we were really excited about it. Uh, but after 9-11, we were just like, nope, this isn't the time for this. That was, you know, it was fun to write, but completely inappropriate now and um this is your first movie right i think i had written one more um you know it, you can write movies and get paid for them but getting them made is a whole other thing but that was the one that was close to being made okay. would have been made but after 9 11 we just felt it was uh you know not appropriate, appropriate. The right and then, time. yeah and then unfortunately um you know the iraq war happened um, there was a lot of conflict in the mid zeros um, in Israel, unfortunately, to the point where uh, people were sort of getting numb to the violence that was going on there. And, but the odd byproduct, uh, byproduct of that was that it felt okay uh, around the year 2006, 2007, Adam called me out of the blue and said, I want to make this movie again. And... Um, so, so how did you meet Adam? How, how did that relationship? I met Adam at Saturday Night Live too. Adam was oh, a comedian. Okay. And I was there at his audition. He auditioned in a Chicago comedy club because by then I was co-producer. So I got to be with Lauren Michaels and scout with him. And I scouted okay. Chris Farley and Chris Rock and Adam Sandler all in the same year. Okay. And, um, and they all eventually got hired. And, um, and Adam, Adam was another person who became one of my best friends at Saturday Night Live. So I interrupted you. So, so the Adam called you in 06, 07. You were about to say it, and I interrupted you. Yeah, and said, I think I want to do Zoan after all. I think I want to do this movie again. Okay. And I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> but, uh, but then we thought about it. And at one point, we had done a rewrite where we thought we'd make them fictional countries, like because it was, uh, you know, maybe that's the way we can get away with it. Um, but by this time, Adam was like, no, let's just make it Israel and let's just go for it. And um, so we did. So we, we, wrote, we, we rewrote it a little bit to fit uh, 2007 and uh, it came out and, you know, it was actually a very big success internationally. It, it did pretty well in the United States, but it made 200 million worldwide. So great. Ended up making a lot of money, but it was a very silly movie with, you know, I saw it. I liked it. You weren't involved with Uncut Gems. That was just Adam. No, no, no. I didn't like that. But it was, you didn't like it? Uh, I thought it was derogatory towards, um, you know, it had a negative, uh, that was my personal opinion. I, uh, you know, the derogatory, 
sometimes objectionable characters um, can be misinterpreted and, and they can, you know, their stories can actually have uh, strong moral messages ultimately. Like one Correct. of my favorite movies is Taxi Driver, <laughs> Martin Scorsese movie with Mar Robert De Niro. He's basically a psychopath who, who ends up uh, trying to assassinate, I believe the mayor. I can't remember, but uh, but yeah, I I, I I didn't I didn't think of it as uh, as a derogatory movie because you well, know, I, I thought it was fascinating because you're kind of you you find yourself this this person is doing everything wrong and you're somehow drawn to him and you're uh, and and then you hate yourself for being drawn to him and and kind of rooting for him and I think that's a good lesson in itself. Okay. Anyway, so 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 it's two thousand seven. So you've done uh, so, so, so let's go from then. So you've done two movies already. So two thousand seven. So I did the Zohan movie. I helped Adam with a couple of other movies since then. I um, I did the Hotel Transylvania movies. Okay, remember that. Also with Adam, and those were probably the most successful things I've been associated with uh, on my own. And then. Um, you know, I've done a lot of things with, um, I can't even remember. I mean, I've done, I did Triumph the Insult Comic Dog on Conan for many years. And then I did a series of political specials with Triumph the Insult Comic Dog uh, for Hulu for the last presidential election. We did about six political specials that year. We were nominated for an Emmy Award and it was very exciting. It was, did all kinds of crazy stuff with, with that puppet and I've since done more with on uh, Stephen Colbert's show with that character and um which which one did you have the canter and I saw it I can't remember okay so then I directed a movie with Adam uh and Chris Rock in nine in 2018 called the week of the week it of. was a movie about a family that was uh it was basically about a, a Long Island dad who's very insecure about, um, you know, the other father being way richer than he is, and um, and but he's the he's the father of the bride and he's very determined to make the wedding without any help from the wealthy father, and yet he's. Uh, you know, he's cutting costs right and left, but he's convinced that it's still going to be great. And it's just a series of disasters. So, so is a lot of your writing based on characters in your life or are you just creating? Some of it is. I mean, that one was, you know, I bond with different writers at Saturday Night Live for different reasons. And like for Conan and I, we never really wrote about recognizable characters. We only wrote kind of absurdist, nonsensical uh, sketches that were based on ideas that had nothing to do with, you know, humanity, just, just pure silliness. And then, uh, Dana Carvey, I wrote with a lot because, um, I liked doing impressions and Dana Carvey was a great impressionist. So we kind of wrote a lot of sketches together and explored the musicality of impressions with people like Johnny Carson and Regis Philbin and, uh, the guy who hosted the McLaughlin group, John McLaughlin, back in the day. Uh, I remember John McLaughlin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so... Every Sunday. Yeah. So we loved writing to people's rhythms that way. And then Adam and I, more than anybody else, Adam and I bonded uh, more on a character-based stuff. He seems like the funniest guy in the world. He is the funniest guy in the world. You, you should watch his stand-up special. It's completely ridiculous. But he's... Um, but yeah, I mean, you know what, oddly enough, you know, people think as a cliche that the comedy world is dominated by Jewish people, but at Saturday Night Live, it really wasn't. Saturday right. Night Live, um, when I got there, me and Al Franken were the only Jewish writers on the staff. It was at the peak of Harvard Lampoon, ironic kind of detached humor, which I was actually a big fan of. Uh, you know, I didn't write Jewish, I think, you know, if I had, they probably wouldn't have been interested in me. 
you know, but the cliche of Jewish writing was more character driven stuff and about anxiety and, you know, the Woody Allen kind of cliche. And, um, but when I met Adam, we had, you know, he was like the first Jewish cast member they'd hired other than John Lovitz, who, um, you know, I, I, did, I, I, I got along with John Lovitz, but I really bonded with Adam. He was from Brooklyn. He, he was born in Brooklyn. We just had a lot in common, uh, you know, and so we would write character driven stuff sometimes together and make it very silly, but stuff that was a little more based at least on this world that we were familiar with. And when we did the week of, it was very much that. It was like there were different characters in the movie that were based on different people we knew specifically, you know. So, so it sounds like a lot of fun, but, but what, what, you know, it sounds like you're pursuing your dream, you're pursuing your passion. You know, are, are there certain things you enjoy more than others or? But, um, the best part is just coming up with the idea. The idea. That's the best part. And, and, and when, when do those ideas, like, when do, when do those Sometimes usually Sometimes it's up? when you're actually meeting with writers to come up with an idea and other times it's in the shower. And it's okay. completely by accident. A lot of the best ideas happen by accident. Just something you see triggers something. And it, it almost feels like a mistake that you came up with it. But it, it and, then, and that's really the most exciting part of the job is just, oh my God, that's really funny. I can't wait for so, that to be a reality. But then sometimes getting it to be a reality is an eternity. Got it. And there are various obstacles can, that can, you know, get in the way. So are you in the process? Do you have a lot of ideas that you're taking, executing on now? Is that, is that what you're at? I always have ideas that are sitting around that are taunting me because they haven't been made yet. Ideas for movies, ideas for television shows. Um, some of which are almost fully formed. Some of which are about half formed. Um, but you know, there's only so much time in the day. I have, I have twins. I have an older boy in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, um, when I was younger, before I got married, before I had kids, I was just this was my whole world, just ideas, ideas, execution, execution. And then I got married and just made a determined effort to balance it a little bit and then I had a boy and just didn't even want to focus as much on you know comedy and uh and then he turned out to have autism so that became an entirely different pursuit that was obviously way more important but at a certain point my wife said you've got to make money you've got to let me run this show because we're going to need a lot of money to get Daniel the support he needs so and that's sort of what my life's been since then like you know my approach to comedy I try to do as much stuff as I can that is um you know written completely from inspiration and written out of the pure love of the idea that's that's the way it always was when I was younger but you know my primary motivation now is to make enough money to make sure that Daniel has everything he needs. How old is Daniel again? Not easy. It's he's 22. 22. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and he's doing great, but you know, it's a, it's, it's really important to, uh, you know, unfortunately these things are, uh, you know, we have a lot of wonderful people that work with him, but, um, but it all costs money. So that's, you know, that's the priority. So I don't always do, um, you know, I can't always focus on the project I want to focus on the most, you know? I understand. Yeah. So right now I, I, I have this movie, this animated movie that I'm doing uh, for Netflix that actually is an idea that I'm very excited about and very happy about doing, but it's very time intensive and it takes, cause I'm also co-directing it. So that's going to take two and a half years. And then, um, and then there's a movie, uh, no, the actually, so I did a show for Fox last month yeah, called well, Let's, no. Let's Be Real. That was a, uh, a pop culture and political uh, 
puppet show, kind of like Spitting Image, but hopefully funnier, that uh, what was different about it was I had humans interacting with the puppets. So, you know, there's a scene like Larry King. Um, Larry King was uh, in Donald Trump's war room after, uh, after the first debate there to give him advice and it was like you know larry i don't want to listen to these political hacks you know you die you know i did great like that kind of thing and um so so and it did very well it, and they want to do more so i'm i'm happy right. with that you know That's we're, great. We're, gonna, we're gonna have more of those episodes uh, coming up in the spring that was just a that was just a one-time special but now so they want to make it a series so so, so educate us a little more on the financial side, you know, not getting personal on yourself, but, but the, the, the financial award is, is, is it just based on when you produce something um, the, on the monetary side, is that based on how many people go see a movie, how many people buy the video rights, like, like wh where's the, you know, where's the biggest bang for the buck? Because you seem to be multi-talented. So if you were just oh. focused on money, what, what would you focus on? Well, working for Adam Sandler is a good deal. It's, you know, fortunately, he's one of my best friends in comedy. And, um, and I think he's very funny. So, so when I work with him, I'm usually very excited about, about the project. So it's kind of a, a two for one that way. But because Adam is incredibly successful, he's one of the last movie stars that exist, I think, especially in comedy. He's done phenomenally well for Netflix. So his movies have really nice budgets, so I get paid well. Okay. You know, this movie that I'm doing now for him, I'm getting paid well, but unfortunately, the time, it takes, it's like over a three-year period. So. And you don't get compensated for your time. You get compensated for the You get product. compensated for the movie. But I the movie that. happens to take three years. So. Got it. I need another steady job <laughs> i definitely need at least one more job <coughs> to be able to uh just cover just cover what i need to cover for uh for the big boy and you know the thing about that having a child with autism is it's not just about year to year it's about his future because you know i'm just getting older and you know so my wife and i worry constantly about making sure that he's going to be Taken Take care, care of when we're gone, you know. Sure. Could be does, any second. He lives in a home, or where does he live? He lives. He has. He lives in a in a house with other uh, adults with autism, young adults with autism. Okay. And he lives in a great program. He, he's with, he's in an amazing program. He actually um, contracted COVID in April, and um, it was uh, terrifying, but. What happened was just um, so inspiring because he had these, you know, he, unfortunately somebody in his, um, you know, he has a great staff of people. And during the pandemic, this was in the early months, um, they were sequestered in a nearby hotel, but one of them contracted COVID, uh, a, a member of the night staff and Daniel has trouble sleeping. So he was one of two young uh, men in the house that uh, contracted COVID from, from this individual. But what was really extraordinary was what happened after that was that he was going to have to be completely isolated and quarantined in his bedroom, not able to come out. And for, for an individual with autism, you know, routine is a big part of their lives. So this was going to be a terribly challenging and, you know, to just compound the horror of it, uh, Michelle and I weren't going to be there. We weren't going to be allowed to, we, you know, we hadn't been allowed to see him. That was right, enough right. Of stress. Once the, once the epidemic hit, we weren't allowed to visit him anymore and he wasn't allowed to visit us. Right. So that had already happened. And then this, now we're not even going to be able to comfort him. And so many of the staff, were willing to volunteer to spend time with him in his room and wear the full PPE equipment, you know, they just, they just shifted into that mode very quickly and selflessly and with no hesitation. And, um, 
it was really a really a beautiful beautiful thing to see you know the whole experience has been a gift in that way in many ways but um you know so able to come into contact with people like that is is really extraordinary so i'm really happy to hear he's doing well it must have been very stressful i'm sure uh during that period of time i'm sure you're very grateful he's okay so, so can you talk about how COVID has affect uh, your industry or yeah. you know, no, 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 I, I, not your family, but, but um, you know. No, no. Well, I mean, it's obviously affected live action uh, shows. I mean, to horribly, you know, in terms of uh, the whole, obviously here in New York, it's, it's so sad how all these people who worked in the theater world uh, you know, I know my sister had several shows uh, in the works and, um, and you know, all these actors and behind the scenes people who work on Broadway and off Broadway uh, and depended on it. Um, it's just, uh, it's just terrible what's happened for them. I've been very lucky because I, I happen to be embarking on this animated movie, like right before the pandemic hit. And, you know, so it was a job that I was always gonna be able to do from my house, um, you know, for the most part, because technology is such that, you know, not only do we have Zoom, but, you know, we can just, animators can just send stuff instantly. Even when I was doing Saturday Night Live cartoons, I was able to work primarily from home. But now you can like look over an editor's shoulder and do all your work from home. And when I did the, the puppet show last month uh, or two months ago, I guess now, uh, I actually did it from my basement. I, <laughs> and that was a live action show. It was shot in Los Angeles uh, because they felt that they needed to shoot it there for expenses. I wanted it to be here they couldn't afford to send it here to do it here so and nobody wanted me to fly so they accommodated me and um uh, i basically had access to all the camera shots they came to your home and everything was done it was well, all done no, nobody came to my home i mean i just they just hooked me up on zoom and set up all these cameras on zoom so that i could see every angle like we're I talk tonight? I could talk to the director as if I was there. Sorry. I said like we're doing tonight. I'm joking. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, I actually so. find that Zoom is uh, like when I'm writing with, uh, collaborating with somebody as a writer, I actually prefer Zoom. I actually prefer communicating this way than to being in a room because you're more focused on the actual work most of the time. So you were saying earlier when we were talking with Polanka, but you think uh, there'll be a lot of changes like that in your industry. Like you're saying you prefer Zoom going forward. There's no reason why you can't do Zoom if you get it done, right? Well, I just think a lot of people are just going to cut costs because they're just going to realize that they don't need the office space. And why fly all over the world, right? That too. I mean, I just think there's a lot of work that can be accomplished without, without having to... You know, yes, when I would have to pitch shows in the past, I would have to be flown to Los Angeles and do a whole song and dance at a conference room with five executives. And now we just get on Zoom. And I don't really think, I think the more people do it, the less people are going to find it strange and find it unnecessary. I was thinking of that, but, but the way your career really took off, it was based on meeting people in person. So you're at a point in your career where Zoom could work fine for you, but if but if you were 20 years younger, I don't I don't know if you'd be saying what you're saying, right? Because all those connections you developed was personal. Years I'm, 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 older, I'm older than you think. 20 years younger, I'd still be pretty old, sadly. I, but if I were 25, let's say, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's harder for people to uh, to break in right now i think um so, because of that but on the other hand on the flip side it's become easier for people to young people to break into the business in general because of technology because they can put things on youtube and just people pick it up and every, you know and they can catch on and you can you know 
it's much more democratic now that way. Right. So, so I, I had a question for you. So if you look, turn Netflix, you turn prime, I mean, the, t the TV seems full of stuff. How are they develop? Is everyone developing like you are on zoom? Meaning should, aren't there movies not being produced because they can't do the set or I, I understand Broadway shows or there are movies that are not being produced. So, yes. So, yes. so how are the movies coming out? The ones that Adam are Chandler just shot a movie and everybody had to stay six feet away at all times when they weren't on set and people had to wear masks and sometimes, you know, plastic, you know, but, protective gear. And, but he got it done. Yeah, so and got, everybody has to take a COVID test every day, that okay. kind of thing. You know, that's how it was for the puppet show. I mean, fortunately I didn't have to be there, but you know, a lot of younger people worked on the show and we're interacting with each other right there on the set. And there was like monitors making sure people were staying appropriately distant, you know, but there'd be moments when, yeah, the puppeteer would have to be reasonably close to another puppet, like closer than six feet, but everybody was wearing masks. You know, that was the good thing about doing a puppet show. The people, the performers could wear masks, except for the celebrities like Larry King. I was actually terrified for Larry King. Because the guy must be, yeah, know, he's, he's up there in the high 80s now. And he, right, right. you know, and he's in there and, uh, you know, without a mask doing his thing, but he made it. <laughs> he's indestructible. So, um, so Robert, the, the, a couple of questions came on the chat and, and uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but one was from a friend. Uh, how you feel about the cancel culture, how it affects comedy? Yeah, oh, that's, that's a good one. Um, I was hoping someone would ask that so that I would say something inappropriate and get canceled. Uh, Go ahead. I think, um, we, you know, we I have very mixed you. feelings about it. I have very mixed feelings about it because I, I am pretty sympathetic to, uh, to people's sensitivity. There are things I agree with and disagree with you know, that I talk to my kids about all the time, like, you know, like we're at a point now where people can't, people aren't allowed to do voiceovers unless they represent the race that they, you know, like a, um, you know, uh, like somebody bowed out of being in um, the show Big Mouth because they weren't biracial and they felt like a biracial performer needed to do that voiceover and i'm just not sure like i don't know the show well enough to know like does being biracial have that much to do with that character if it does if it really informs the character maybe there's an argument for it but you know sometimes i worry that we are starting to define ourselves by like i don't think you should be defined by any singular aspect like i don't think the fact that I'm Jewish should necessarily define me. It definitely is a huge part of what I am. Would I object to somebody who does a great impression of me who isn't Jewish playing me in a sketch? No, I would want to hear the best impressionist <laughs> do my voice. Like I had that problem. We had somebody who did an incredible Kamala Harris on the puppet show. Okay. And uh, they told us we couldn't use her because, because she wasn't a person of color. So uh -huh. we didn't use her. So we used somebody else who did a great job. But not as good. Uh, she, was, she ended up being really good, thankfully. Okay. But I just felt like, okay, we're talking about a sketch comedy show. We're talking about a voice that, you know, the characterization of Kamala Harris it was not a serious characterization. It was a, you know, it, it, it was a, a surface impression, you know, and I didn't feel like, it, it felt like anybody who can do the impression, you know, should be allowed to do it. Like Eddie Murphy used to do fantastic impressions of Jewish people, you know, in the, in the Nutty Professor, there's a hilarious scene where he plays like eight characters and one of them is an old Jewish man. And frankly, it's like infinitely funnier to see a guy like Eddie Murphy impersonating oh, agree. 
an old Jewish guy. It's, it's more interesting than seeing a Jewish guy do it. <laughs> and I didn't feel like it was done in any kind of derogatory fashion. So, so that's where I get, you know, I get kind of uh, confused about it. Uh, you know, what I tell my kids is, you know, anything where the joke is at the expense of someone in a, as a stereotype, like I, I, you know, I think any kind of racial humor that that um, reinforces stereotypes, that you got to be, you know, much more wary of. But I think impressions are, can be very affectionate and, and are not necessarily derogatory. Uh, and I kind of think the way we all talk is something, the differences in the way we all talk is something that we can celebrate, you know? It's, it's, it's fun and cool and hilarious that we, we all have different dialects from different parts of the world. So, and I don't, you know, I think if it's done with affection, I, I don't know why there'd be anything wrong with that. So that's, that's at least, you know, <laughs> that's, that's about 5% of my answer to that question. <laughs> I could okay. go on forever. Yeah, I mean, for, first of all, you know, we, we, I really appreciate you doing this for the Fifth Avenue uh, community. I, I feel like we just touched the surface and we can go for several hours, but I did tell you it would be an hour. And well, I can go a little longer if people had questions. I don't mind if people want to stay, if they're... You know, uh, okay. Can't. Yeah, there are a couple. Yeah, there are some I'll questions. One more thing about the cancel culture, which is okay. Um, well, the other thing that really bugs me is when somebody is castigated for something that they did twenty years ago, like a joke or a comedic statement that they made, or because we're all evolving together, and I don't think you know people should be punished for. If, if that person was doing the same thing today, that's a whole different scenario. But if it's somebody who, you know, did an impression of someone or did a certain type of joke that the audience howled with laughter at, I mean, should the entire audience be canceled for what they laughed at 20 years ago? I just think we have to be kinder and more tolerant of each other. And, you know, what's the point of, I don't see the point of um, the whole point of castigating someone, you know, and this is very Jewish kind of, uh, you know, directive. You tell someone that they did something wrong so that they will absorb that information and change. You know, you don't just tell them they did something wrong 20 years ago and wipe them off the face of the earth and tell them that they can't work anymore. You, it's, it's totally cool to call somebody on it, but you know, yeah, give, give, person, give them a warning, give them a fair chance, you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I just I think agree. that's all. You know, what's the point where we should all be kind enough to, we're all evolving and we should allow ourselves to evolve together. Well, it's also hard uh, to be politically correct and be a good comedian because part of being a comedian is being funny. Yeah. And if you're funny, you're not really politically You're pointing correct. out uncomfortable things all the time. That's, right. you know, kind of almost the essence of, of comedy is, is, you know, identifying something that's, that's uncomfortable. So uh, another question that came in is uh, growing up, was there someone a family member or someone that was like really funny that you said, Hey, I want to be like that person. Or, or did you, well, my father oh, was really right. funny. My father was the funniest person in our family. And, um, I didn't get to know that part of him. He was up with me. He was always friendly, warm, you know, but yeah. tell us about that. Right. With people he really liked, he was funny. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> If you got to know, no, he, no, you know what he would do? He would, uh, he had a lot of fun uh, with his job. You know, I had friends who went to him and they would tell me stories. And, and even when I, I, I was a dental assistant a couple of summers for him and I would see like, <laughs> he would get, he would be doing bonding on somebody's tooth and it would require an, an, an enormous amount of cotton in their mouths. Right. Point where there was no way that they could ever answer his question coherently. 
And so people would have these incredibly dry mouths, little squirt thing going in there to keep them from passing out. And he'd be, he'd be you know, bonding their teeth. And, um, and out of nowhere, he would ask like a 70 year old woman a question like, you have three grandchildren, right? If they were all drowning at the same time, which one would you, <laughs> which one would you save? That kind of thing. Got it. So, 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 so you... Nonsensical questions. <laughs> so your dad had to have the humor in him, which, which you brought out in your profession. Yeah, he was very funny and he turned me on to a lot of my favorite comedy. He gave me, when I was seven years old, he bought me a Peanuts book uh, a tiny little paperback uh, one summer night and uh, and I spent the whole night reading it and I was hooked on Peanuts uh, from that moment on and he turned me on to the Marx Brothers. He would tell me, okay, it would be like 11 o'clock at night and I'm nine years old and he's like, you're staying up because a night at the opera and a day at the races are playing back to back on channel five and you have to watch them. You're going to love them. And uh, Blanca and I both watched them, and we did. And uh, you know, and and he took us to Woody Allen movies when we were like when I was like 10, 11 years old. He started taking me to Woody Allen movies and Mel Brooks. Cool. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks for answering that. Uh, someone had asked, "What? What do you have a perception with the future direction of Jewish comedy?" It's not my question. It's someone else's question. It's, that's, uh, that's interesting because, uh, like I said, when I started, I felt like Jewish comedy and Jewish identity in comedy was sort of on the, sort of had been placed on the, it had been marginalized. Like Woody Allen had already kind of peaked and he had sort of represented that kind of Jewish neurotic thing and Mel Brooks kind of represented a, a different kind of like uh, a more aggressive satirical approach to comedy that felt kind of Jewish. Uh, but when I joined Saturday Night Live, there was a lot of, you know, David Letterman was the reigning king of, you know, late night comedy and comedy had become very dry and uh, ironic and detached. And it was something I liked very much, like I said, but it, it didn't feel like, um, it didn't feel very Jewish and it didn't feel like there were a lot of Jewish writers thriving in that field. And honestly, it wasn't until, like when Adam Sandler joined Saturday Night Live, even though he had a very absurdist, silly side to him, just his presence alone, I think, made a big difference. Um, and then he wrote the Hanukkah song. Yeah, the Hanukkah song, sure. Which I think <laughs> people underestimate how much that meant to that young generation of Jewish kids at the time. Sure. Adam grew up in New Hampshire and Adam did not, uh, you know, I grew up on the Upper West Side. So I barely knew that there were other types of people <laughs> than Jewish people. I mean, I went to like B'nai Jeshurun Day School. So, but Adam went to, he grew up on, in New Hampshire and um, he would get, you know, beaten up sometimes for being Jewish. So he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder and it was very important to him at Saturday Night Live. And he would tell me this, he does not want to portray Jewish people in the comedy stereotype way of being like the nebbish or the weakling or the insecure neurotic thing. He wanted to portray, he wanted the, you know, the, uh, he wanted to portray Jewish people as strong and proud of their religion and proud of their heritage and, you know, almost more of a Sabra kind of approach, an American Sabra approach to Judaism. That makes and, sense. A lot of the movies he's done. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. The character he plays in movies has, you know, first of all, he, he always makes the character Jewish. Right. And there were times like when a studio head was like, really, you need a yarmulke at the wedding? <laughs> <He's> like, yep. <laughs> yep. I'm wearing a yarmulke. That's uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, and I think he sort of paved the way for Judd Apatow, who was his friend at NYU. And then Judd 
brought Seth Rogen, made Seth Rogen a movie star. And I think, you know, it, it all kind of cascaded. And I think there became a new kind of Jewish humor, um, you know, that emerged um, that was very uh, raw and, but, you know, not absurdist, but, you know, grounded in humanity uh, and, you know, uh, very effective, so. So someone asked if, if you would to do your best uh, impression. Of? Anyone you want. The, the, mo the most funniest one you can do to oh share my with God. I don't know. And you can say no. No, I did like, you know, like I used to do on Conan, I used to do all these impressions every week on, uh, you know, cause he would, Im he would, in he would, interview photographs and, and speaking of I don't know if it would be acceptable now I used to do Don King and Bill Cosby uh people like that it's acceptable for us no, no. <laughs> are you saying socially acceptable yeah I don't know what people would say now if I were doing that uh on Conan nowadays I have no idea if people would care you know the the impressions had nothing to do with anything but you know, characteristics of Don King and Bill Cosby that did not have to do with race. You know, Don King was like this huckster who would, you know. So, so you've avoided any uh, social norms, like you haven't gotten in trouble. I mean, you, you, I've you, gotten in trouble over the years a little bit, but shockingly, Triumph the Insult Comic Dog has almost never gotten in trouble because I think there's sort of a court jester aspect to him where he's like not threatening. Okay. Even though he's insulting people, there's these layers of irony. He's a puppet and he's a little cute dog with a bow tie. So people are less insulted by, by his comments than if, you know, somebody who looked like me did them. <laughs> so, so, so to, we could go on forever, just, just to end tonight. Is, is there something in, the, in your industry that you'd like to see changed? Um, and it, maybe it's what we were just talking about, the, the, the social sensitivities, are, are there? I mean, I'm not saying that I want that changed because I just, you know, on the other hand, I mean, I'm very sensitive to complaints about, oh, politically correct. What is everybody so sensitive about? And honestly, a lot of, I, I don't look at it as that. I look at it as most of the time progress, you know, when people point these things out. What I'm objecting to is, to castigate people who did something 20 years ago no, before everybody made that point. But I mean, there's things Triumph did 20 years ago that I would probably cut out of a routine now. And I certainly wouldn't do certain, certain kinds of jokes that I did back then. Okay. Um, so I did a, I did a Cantor Malavani impression earlier. That's, that's you did it. And it was very good. Thank you. The, the, the one by the chuppah. How was the second song? It was better, right? It was terrific. <laughs> no, it was, of course, it was fantastic. He's, he's, he's coming to my son's, my twin's bar mitzvah, and I couldn't be more excited. To have him. We're, we're with Rabbi Babbage. They're both very excited. Rabbi Babbage, too, whom I also love. Uh, so I'm grateful to both of them. Grateful to the, and I, you know, I would have done it at your synagogue as well, but, you know, we have, uh, no, no, I mean, family I, members in Long Island, and it's 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 there's a lot of complicated issues, obviously. No, I, I'm happy you're doing it. It's easier for your mom and your mother-in-law, so I, I think you're uh, you're doing it properly. So we'll have other opportunities to share in some class with God's help. Writing, do you shoot hoops? Yeah, of course I shoot hoops. I'm Jewish, and I grew up in Manhattan. Yes, I, sh I play. I play. I play king of the court with my 12-year-old twins almost every day. Oh, with Adam, do I shoot hoops with Adam? You know, one time I played basketball with Adam about 10 years ago and I got so out of breath that he never invited me to play another game with him. <laughs> <laughs> I terrified him. I was just like, <gasps> but yeah, when I was younger, I used to play with him all the time. He's an actually, he's actually a great basketball player. He is, he's good. I know he's a big oh, basketball fan. a Jewish guy. <laughs> okay, that's fair, that's fair. <laughs> You touched on Dana Carvey too. Now I'm reading these. Yeah. Okay. All right, Robert, but uh, 
really very much appreciate your time and your friendship and uh, everything you do. Yeah, and uh, you. hopefully this will be the first of uh, many things we get to do. Oh, you know, no, I'll be here to heckle Blanca whenever you do that. Uh, okay, booked. All right, but thank you so much, Robert. Have a great evening. Miles Thanks, Thanks, on the Thanks, Thanks, Rabbi. Okay, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Robert, thank you so much for your time. And as always, um, thank you. you know, uh, we wish you a mazel tov on, on your twins bar mitzvah coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Play. Thank you. I'm still, I read your, I read, I read what you sent me and it was great, but the one you did a year earlier had some very specific thoughts. Right. I found it. I found oh, it. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. No, it means a lot to me. Uh, I, I, I've asked the rabbi for, um, for a while, for a copy of his his Rosh Hashanah sermon from two years ago, it's it, it terrific. They're terrific, and they're all written yeah. down, and and they're great. Uh, whenever I'm away, I always ask him, and you know, our, his sermons come out every Friday through email. Yeah. And you see them, but they're terrific. Yeah. So yeah. Right, we found it, and we're going to try to send it to you. And I want to thank, thank you. you. And uh, you know, as you'm sure you know, like uh, humor has a deep rooted history in Jewish culture. Um, the Gemara says that Rabbah used to always uh, begin his presentations with a joke in order to lighten the mood. I'm sure he would have benefited of having a, a joke writer uh, that uh, people have today. He didn't have that luxury, but he figured it out. Uh, you so, do pretty uh, well starting off a lot of your sermons with jokes. <laughs> and uh, we just want to bless you that you continue to, to bring happiness to people's lives and to, and to bring... Um, um, to uplift people in, in dark times, and uh, it's a real skill that you have that the, uh, the our sages, you know, say could use properly could really uh, brighten the world. And please, God, you should continue what you do, and much success and happiness and nachas from your family. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in shul. That's the main thing. God willing, soon enough, I hope. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. participating, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.